in our series. I'm really sorry about the tech difficulties we had. Thank you very much for your patience. As usual, please post any questions you have in the live chat box function, or alternatively, you can add your questions to the Google Doc, which is linked to the channel. Today, we are very excited and honored to welcome one of the founding fathers of evolutionary medicine, Professor Randy Nessie. Anyone who's written anything, done any research, or indeed had an interest in evolutionary medicine has surely been influenced by Professor Nessie's work. He and the late George Williams published their seminal book, Why We Get Sick, in the mid 90s, which emphatically relaunched evolutionary medicine into the intellectual spotlight. This was the beginning of a new era, changing the face of contemporary biomedicine and has informed and inspired much research pursuing answers to big medical problems such as antibiotic resistance, aging, autoimmune diseases and cancer. Professor Nessie is a clinical psychiatrist. And so it was really just a matter of time before another great book came out ushering in the new field of evolutionary psychiatry. I hand you over now to Professor Nessie to talk about sadness, madness, and natural selection. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. It's great to be with you. And, I'm, and it is the, too bad about the fancy technology, but it's better than having to fly across the ocean, although I wish I could be there with you. I had so many pleasant visits to Oxford as we were getting evolutionary medicine going. Um, I think I'll just dive right into the slides, but before I say anything else to everybody out there, the fun of this for all of us is your questions. I mean, you can watch this video anytime in the next year, but what's fun about this is asking your questions live. So don't wait, go ahead in that chat box and please start asking questions right from the beginning. And that'll make sure that we have a good discussion uh, as we go. Uh, it might even be that Paula told me there's a question so urgent, it really should be done right in the middle. That's fine too, Paula. Um, let's just have fun with this. I will share my screen and hope that works properly. I bet it's working, is it? Good, okay. So Sadness, Madness, and Natural Selection, it's a bit of a kitschy title, but what the heck? Um, this is what we're talking about. Um, the sources, uh, I'm gonna to promise to try to say some new things. A lot of this comes from the book that I published last year, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, and a fancier academic version is in a textbook of psychiatry. Most everything's on my website. But again, the reason for doing things live like this is so we can talk with each other and talk about things that don't fit very well in textbooks and the like. And with that in mind, I have some new themes I'm going to offer today. The first one is tacit creationism, which I think is a great impediment to making progress in medicine in general. How to study ideographic causes, the peculiarities of individual lives. It's very hard to integrate those into psychiatric thinking. And then there's the reality of organic complexity, which I'd like to argue is completely different from the complexity of design systems. This is our little outline, seven questions. Why the heck are mental disorders so common? Why is mental health research failing? Why are emotional disorders so common? How can we study these ideographic situations? Why can't we control our eating and drinking? Why is sex so unsatisfying sometimes? And why do genes for serious disorders persist? Each one gets about five minutes, uh, then we'll have time for questions. First question, why the heck are mental disorders so common? Before you can even ask that, another question comes first. I first got into evolutionary medicine because I was frustrated as a psychiatrist. It was clear to me that some of my friends were becoming behaviorists, others neuroscientists, others pharmacologists, you know, others psychoanalysts. And it seemed to me there needed to be some way to integrate everything. So I wandered over to the Museum of Natural History where I met Dick Alexander and, and Barbara Smuts and Bobby Lowe and all kinds of other wonderful evolutionary biologists. And they pointed out there's a whole separate question that needs to be asked. That is, why are we vulnerable to diseases in general? Why didn't natural selection do a better job? Two kinds of explanation are needed. My medical education was wonderful and it was all about why some people get sick and why others don't about the mechanisms. Now I was asking a different question. Why are we all so vulnerable to disease? 
Um, my work with George Williams, and interestingly, this book, um, George and I sat in a lovely garden in a B&B in Oxford for a week and went over the final proofs in 1992 after a wonderful meeting that Helena Cronin organized on evolution and medicine um, at Oxford. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, in that book, we argued that you could categorize the reasons for, the, the, for vulnerability in six ways. One, mutations happen. That's an obvious one. Two, novel environments has been a main theme of evolutionary medicine, but it doesn't stop there. Infection, they evolve faster than we do. Trade-offs, nothing can be perfect. Reproduction at the cost of health turns out to be a deep one, especially for psychiatry. And finally, a lot of defenses are painful but useful. Pain, nausea, vomiting, and anxiety, and low mood. This has given rise to the field of evolutionary medicine, which is the intersection of the practical field of medicine and basic science of evolutionary biology. And it really is quite astounding that there should be anything new here. I mean, Darwin's grandfather, for goodness sakes, was thinking about how evolution should be able to influence and help explain disease. But here we are, especially in the United States, we're backwards. On the other hand, evolutionary medicine is growing very nicely. We now have a wonderful scientific society, the International Society for Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, with an Oxford Press Journal, um, a, a database of resources, um, a, a newsletter, the EvMed Review, and just recently something called Club EvMed, which is a weekly journal club. Uh, if you're interested in that, please join us. It's at clubevmed.org. Evolutionary psychiatry also has grown wonderfully. I'd just like to emphasize how many different people are contributing to growing this field. The very first was Brent Winograd, who inspired me at the time I was on sabbatical at Stanford, writing the book, Why We Get Sick. Um, then Darwinian Psychiatry by McGuire and Teresi was a landmark early volume. Simon Baron Cohen, there in the UK, an expert on autism, wrote a wonderful book on the maladapted mind, edited book. And EPSIC uh, is a, the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group sponsored by the Royal College of Psychiatry. And that group now has over a thousand members and is probably the world's leading organization for evolution and psychiatry. A new group in Ireland is forming similarly. Nothing like this in the, in the States, unfortunately, yet. Uh, but it's so wonderful that this is growing very well in the UK. Uh, Loss of Sadness, Horowitz and Wakefield is a landmark volume. Martin Brunn has written extensively recently. He is a psychiatrist, but also an evolutionary medicine expert as well. Um, and this is my recent book, the new book by Mike Abrams on cognitive behavioral therapy in the light of evolutionary medicine. So it's all coming along quite nicely. Um, I'm going to share with you my revised version of the explanations for vulnerability. Those six have proved really useful for a lot of people, but my thinking has now gradually evolved, may I say, um, to that there's two basic reasons for vulnerability. Why aren't our bodies better? One is there are a lot of things natural selection just can't do. Uh, that's what we were taught in medical school. Um, it can't avoid mutations, it can't start fresh, and it can't keep up with rapidly changing environments. But the second part is of deeper interest to me now, which is, are there situations that natural selection really perfects a trait to maximize gene transmission, but at the cost of disease vulnerability? So we'll come back to this, and this is my current line of thinking for a possible new book. Our topic today is mental disorders. I'm going to simplify and say that there are four different categories. Emotional ones, sadness, fear, and others. Relationships, behavior, addiction, and eating disorders, and cognition. We'll call it madness, distortions, and delusions. The burden of mental disorders is even as more overwhelming than most of us know. Uh, for reproductive age women in the developed world, it's fully 60% of the disease burden total. About a third of the total disease burden, that is disability adjusted lost years of life to full functioning is from depression. Number two is schizophrenia. Number three is bipolar. After that, traffic accidents, a lot of which are alcohol related. After that, obsessive compulsive disorder. We're two thirds of the way, two thirds of all of the burden. And we're just now getting to things like arthritis then we come to self-injury. This is just overwhelming. 
And I pause here to note that, you know, it's not just those other people who have these problems, it's all of us and our parents and our kids and our friends. Um, so it's a very personal and, and delicate matter. And I'm, I'm gonna be talking about it in kind of a cold way, a scientific way, um, but rest assured that having seen patients for 40 years, it's all too close to home and with my own family and friends as well and yours. This is a lovely little office, and I just want to emphasize how satisfying the practice of psychiatry can be. I just loved it. Um, seeing people one by one and coming to an understanding of how they got their problem and what can be done about it, almost everyone can be helped. And it's just a very satisfying work. However, that work one by one, if I look out my window sometimes, on a rainy day especially, um, it seems like there's a tsunami of unhappy people with mental problems out there, just way too many uh, to possibly help. We really need to try to figure out some other way to get a grasp on what causes these problems and what we can do about them. Obviously, huge investments have been made in mental health research very appropriately. But this, my, my perspective is, and it's not just mine, that we aren't accomplishing what we want to accomplish. We're trying to find the causes, we're not doing so well. Um, this all emerged from the crisis for the field in the 1970s. Diagnosis was shown to be embarrassingly subjective. UK psychiatrists diagnosed most, most of their psychotic patients as, as psychotic patients as uh, schizophrenic. In the, U, in the US, they call them bipolar. How, how all just subjective. Um, different groups were blaming different causes and offering different treatments. Some said it's bad learning. Some said it was bad toilet training. Some said it was early abuse. Some said it was bad genes. The profession was ridiculed at that time. And medications were just starting to show their effectiveness. And a big factor is that insurance was coming in to pay for treatment, and it only wanted to pay for medical diseases. A solution was needed. And the solution was to emulate medicine, to take a medical model. And by that, people meant defining disorders objectively, looking for and finding the brain causes, and creating new treatments. It was a time of great hope that we finally were going to be scientific and solve these problems. The first thing was defining disorders objectively. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 3 came out in 1980, just when I was beginning as an assistant professor. And it really did make diagnosis objective by giving lists of checkoff things to see who did and who didn't have carefully defined disorders. So where are we now 30 years later, 40? From the page one of a major psychiatric textbook in 2009, the very first page says, there's little reason to believe that these diagnostic categories are valid. What? I mean, we've revolutionized the entire profession uh, to use these diagnoses, and there's wide agreement now that they're not valid. What do people mean they're not valid? Well, what they mean is we haven't been able to find specific causes for them. Because this has been our model. There should be, each disorder is thought to have been caused and defined by specific brain pathology, and suffice it to say, we've not found it. There is not a single major mental disorder that we can uh, diagnose using genes or blood tests or scans or anything. There are differences. There are genetic differences and brain scan differences and neuroendocrine differences, but not enough to distinguish one problem from another. Alan Francis, who was the architect of the DSM-3, um, coming on to the DSM-5 more recently, said, the incredible and recent advances in neuroscience, molecular biology, and brain imaging that have taught us so much about normal brain functioning are still not relevant to the clinical practicalities of everyday psychiatric diagnosis. The clearest evidence supporting a disappointing fact is that not even one biological test is ready for inclusion in the criteria sets for DSM-5. So we all thought back in 1980 that we were going to have specific tests for specific disorders and specific treatments. It has not worked out. Huda Akil, a dear friend from University of Michigan and a very world-leading neuroscientist, says in an article with Nobel laureates in science, unfortunately, there have been no major breakthroughs in the treatment of schizophrenia in the last 50 years, and no major breakthroughs in the treatment of depression in the last 20 years. 
And Thomas Insel, who has ran the, the National Institutes of Mental Health for the United States for, I think, 10 years, said in 2011, what have we been doing for five decades? It ain't working. Maybe we just need to rethink this whole approach with no validated biomarkers and too little in the way of novel medical treatment since 1980. It's time to rethink mental disorders. So I want to emphasize, it's not me. These are, and these people deserve enormous credit. The leaders of the field are forthrightly saying the facts. Um, what we've been doing has not been working. We need to find new directions. I'll also emphasize here before I go one more statement for, further, um, treatment is effective. I'll just remind you, I'm not criticizing the field of psychiatry. I'm not telling anyone to stay away from treatment. It usually can be reliably, moderately, at least effective. But the matter of finding the causes, we're stuck. Why is this paradigm failing? I'm going to suggest to you today because it imitates a medical model, but doesn't actually use a proper medical model. That's because it doesn't distinguish symptoms from diseases the way the rest of medicine does. And it doesn't recognize symptoms. In the rest of medicine recognizes pain and fever as symptoms that are useful. And it sets you on a search for causes. When our patients have anxiety or low mood, uh, we don't usually go looking for the causes that might be arousing an emotion normally. The rest of medicine understands pathophysiology in the light of normal pathology. We have a hard time doing that in psychiatry. And medicine also doesn't expect to find one cause for every syndrome. It recognizes things like heart failure can come from many, many different interacting causes. And more provocatively, I'm going to suggest today that tacit creationism, which pervades all of biology, encourages us to think about the body as if it's a machine with discrete parts that have specific functions of the sort that would be there if it was designed. But the body was not designed. It's a tangled mess of partially discrete separate functions and organs and loci that are very different. And I think we're impaired by thinking about it as if it's a machine. So what to do? Evolution is not a wholesale cure for these problems, but it does provide a missing foundation. Um, the rest of animal behavior studies are all based on evolutionary biology and the adaptive functions of behavior. Those perspectives are just now coming in to psychiatry. I think there's an enormous opportunity here, not to generate quick cures, but to start to figure out what the heck these disorders really are and why we're vulnerable. Second question, and you note that the black slides are your cue that we're talking about um, a different section now. So why the heck are emotional disorders so common? An, a common approach, especially amongst evolutionarily minded people, is to say, how does schizophrenia increase fitness? How does depression increase fitness? How does OCD increase fitness? This is the biggest mistake in the field. This is a wrong question. Diseases are not shaped by natural selection. They don't have functions. Um, it's, it gets common because our human minds tend to attribute functions to everything, but it's a terrible mistake. Our better question is why did natural selection leave us vulnerable to disease? That makes great sense. I decided after treating people with emotional disorders for 10 years to start learning about emotions. I went to that big thousand page textbook and it had all of one half page about normal emotions. Oops. After working on this for a year, I was frustrated, I was confused, and I was hopeless. And I really gave it up for a while. It just didn't make any sense. Then I turned to the master. William James, 1893, he studied emotions and said, as far as the scientific psychology of the emotions goes, I may have been surfeited by too much reading of classic works on the subject, but I should as leaf read verbal descriptions of the shape of rocks on a New Hampshire farm as toil through them again. They give one nowhere a central point of view or a deduction or general principle. They distinguish and refine and specify in infinitum without ever getting on to another logical level. So I figured I was in good company being confused, although it was disturbing that it was 100 years later and things hadn't advanced all that much. People were still arguing about how many basic emotions are there or 
Are they better viewed as dimensions? We need a new question. That new question comes from evolution. Why do emotions exist at all? And the answer is they're useful. They're useful responses like sweating, pain, fever, nausea, cough, that are regulated by systems that detect the situation in which they're useful. My 1990 paper, I think, is probably my useful, most useful contribution uh, to evolution and psychiatry. It doesn't ask the question, what is this emotions function that I think is the wrong function that's misled many people. Instead, it suggests we need to ask, in what situation is this emotion useful? And it specified emotions as special states that improve coping in situations that have recurred over evolutionary time that influence fitness. This is what everybody had been looking for with regards to emotion, something clear and crisp and nicely outlined. But the more I looked, the more it looked like a Jackson Pollock. Just nothing like what we want, nothing crisp and beautiful and scientifically clear. I did then take a gander at trying to, or flyer at trying to make a, a diagram of where emotions came from. This is imaginary, but it points out that emotions evolve from prior emotional states. And there are two great branches on the tree of emotions. One dealing with dangers, losses, bad things, and the other dealing with opportunities. And these branches on the tree are boughs that are overlapping each other. So that each different emotional state isn't completely distinct with a sharp line around it. It overlaps the others, but there are different states. They correspond to situations. Negative emotions are often thought to be abnormal. Sure seems like depression and anxiety are abnormal, but they wouldn't exist except that they're useful, especially in the face of risk or loss. Risk, in the face of risk, anxiety is useful. It gets you out of there and keeps you from going back. Loss causes sadness. And one of the first things I realized from this deep dive into emotions is that loss is different from wasted effort. And low mood is not the same thing as sadness. More about this in a minute. Then there are all the other emotions that are neglected in psychiatry. We focus everything on anxiety and depression, but every single emotion can be disordered by having either too much or too less, too little. DSM defines emotions as abnormal based on the number, severity, and duration of symptoms. This is essential uh, for making things reliable, but it's not valid. And everybody knows it's not valid because there's no way to validate it. To validate it, you need to assess the situation, see if the situation is actually present, but that's a subjective problem. This all came to a head in creating the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, uh, Diagnostic Criteria for Major Depression. Uh, Jerry Wakefield pointed out um, that you know, we already have an exclusion for people in the few weeks after loss of a loved one. If they have depression symptoms, then it's not called abnormal. It's called normal grief. Only after a few weeks is it called abnormal. And the people who were writing the DSM-5s said, well, what are you suggesting? Jerry Wakefield said, well, there's other situations like that that also normally cause depression symptoms. And the people writing DSM-5 said, yep, you're right. You know what? We need to eliminate the grief exclusion because that makes the whole enterprise subjective. And so now, even if you've lost a loved one uh, a few weeks ago and you're having all the symptoms of depression, you're diagnosed as having major depression, uh, not normal sadness and grief. It sure seems, however, like most bad feelings are abnormal. And we've all seen all these reports in the last few weeks of COVID causing a massive epidemic of mental health disorders. Is that right? There certainly is all kinds of misery across the world. People can't be with their loved ones. Um, there are a lot of people dying, but you know, just are these mental, mental disorders? Do we have an epidemic of people having abnormal emotions? or, if they, but they're useless. It doesn't do any good to be anxious and depressed for no reason. This is a conundrum. And I put a lot of thinking to it. Are, are useless bad feelings abnormal? My answer is no. Most useless emotions are nonetheless normal. How can this possibly be? First, the smoke detector principle. Second, 
normal sensitization. Third, a lot of emotions are good for our genes, but not for us. And finally, modern environments arouse a lot of emotions inappropriately. I'm going to give quick examples of each of these before we go on. The smoke detector principle points out that cheap false alarms can protect against huge possible losses. That's why we put up with false alarms in our smoke detectors that go off from toast. We want to be warned about every single time when there is a serious fire. I started looking at this and realized that you know, we needed to calculate when it would be wise for an alarm to go off. And using signal detection theory from Swetson Green 1960, you were able to calculate exactly what probability of harm would make it worthwhile to have, say, a panic attack. You need to know the cost of panic or the cost of harm if you don't have a panic attack in the face of possible danger. And the possibility of danger being there is the issue. Can you see the lion there? It might be a lion. It might just be an illusion. Should you run away? You want to get water for your family. But this is a conundrum. Every animal faces this problem and they solve it very well. Whether you should run or not depends on the cost of panic. Let's call it 100 calories. Depends on the cost of no panic if there's a lion there. 100,000 calories, we'll say. That's about how many calories in your body. Um, the ratio is 1,000 to 1. So what does this mean? It means that you should flee whenever the noise behind the bush makes it more than one chance in 1,000 <coughs> that it's made by a lion. And that means that 999 of 1,000 panic attacks will be unnecessary, but nonetheless perfectly normal. This changed how I viewed panic attacks. <clears throat> and it helped my patients enormously too. Instead of feeling like they were defective people, uh, they realized that, yep, false alarms are normal in these systems. And I'm having too many false alarms in a normal system. I'm not gonna be talking much in this lecture about the practical utility of evolution for psychiatric practice. There are all kinds of ways it's practically effective. I'm presuming that many people watching this talk are more from the scientific anthropology biology line, uh, but there's a whole separate talk I give about how understanding evolution makes you a better psychiatrist. This is a dramatic example. I began telling my patients, you know, I used to tell my patients, no, it's not a brain disorder. It's a, a psychiatric disorder. Um, your heart is fine. You're not having seizures. It's, it's a psychiatric disorder. And they would always say, but my heart is pounding. Send me to a cardiologist. And I would finally change my tune. And I said, listen, what you're having is a normal, useful emergency response, <clears throat> but it's a false alarm, like a smoke detector. And at that point, a fair number of my patients said, oh, in that case, I won't worry about it. And it was remarkably helpful for them. So this is a smoke detector principle. False alarms are normal. This also has big implications for the rest of medicine. Um, most of what doctors do is treat symptoms safely. How can it be safe? If these are normal, useful things, pain, cough, fever, and nausea, well, it is safe, except for that one time in a thousand. And I'd like doctors to start thinking this way in their everyday medical practice. Big implications for psychopharmacology. This means that blocking those bad feelings, even long-term, can be fine and not interfere with a person's life for the most part. Second explanation for why so many bad feelings are normal but useless is sensitization. If in fact, three times you went out to get water and each time a lion attacked you, it would be really smart for the threshold to go down and you to become more sensitive to cues. And that means you're gonna have more and more panic attacks. This becomes a positive feedback cycle for many people with panic attacks because they notice their heart racing just a little bit. They think, oh my God, a panic attack is starting again. It's happening again. And that's, that itself spirals them into a panic attack. Positive feedback. There are a lot of emotions that benefit our genes, but not us. This is a topic of a whole separate lecture. Unrequited love, jealousy, envy. Um, a lot of those aren't doing us any good, um, but they're trying to get us to do things that might increase our reproduction. And then there's a fourth explanation that we're in environments very different from, from modern environments. Um, and fear, envy, unachievable goals. We watch television and get on YouTube and uh, Facebook 
and see all these wonderful lives that seem so much more accomplished and beautiful than, than we are, um, makes us feel bad. Probably we're gonna move from anxiety to depression. The usual approach is why do some people get depressed? An evolutionary approach asks a different question. Why do we all have a capacity for mood variation? This brings up the more fundamental thing about why vary your motivation? Why not just keep it the same all the time? The answer is that sometimes there are big payoffs. Other times there are low payoffs. You should adjust your risk taking and your initiative depending. Picking raspberries offers a pretty good example. Um, your mood changes as you go from bush to bush. This is one of the most profound and simple findings from behavioral ecology, uh, Eric Charnow's marginal value theorem. I'll spare you the calculus, but try to explain very quickly how long you should stay at each bush. It takes this long, the search time, to find a new bush. And when you find a new bush, you start picking raspberries and you get a whole lot at once. It's a wonderful, excited feeling to get a bunch at once. And then there are fewer and fewer and fewer. Your motivation goes down and finally you give up on that bush and you move to a new one. If you pick every single raspberry on the bush, you get this many raspberries and this amount of time. And that's the slope. Pretty good. But how about if you went faster between bushes? This person picks just a few raspberries and then moves to a new bush, this many raspberries, that slope represents the number of raspberries per minute, not as good. The optimum is to get this number of raspberries, it's the tangent there. And that actually turns out to be the average number of raspberries per minute over many bushes. This marginal value theorem is Part, it is central to our everyday lives and motivation. Um, I'm going to try to keep you engaged to the end of this talk and then the question period afterwards. But we all should understand that our attention flags after a while. Things have to keep coming um, in order for us to stay with what we're doing. And motivation is good at first, and then it kind of goes away because there are all kinds of other things that demand our attention. There are lots of times in life um, propitious times when payoff is positive. It doesn't take very long to find a new bush. You get a big payoff, you find a new bush, and the longer you stay out there foraging, the more raspberries or whatever you're getting, you get per minute, good times. If only life was always like that. All too often it's like this. Very hard to find something new, not a big payoff. The longer you stay out there doing that, the more you're wasting your energy. In unpropitious situations, all initiative is maladaptive. This really violates the idea a lot of people have that we should always be perky and enthusiastic. There are times when the costs are greater than the benefits for all available options. In that case, the best thing to do is nothing. And a motto for unpropitious times is don't just do something, stand there. Alas, mood is not just for berry picking. It's far more rich and complicated and it guides our social interactions because it's social resources that influence our reproductive success and what we get and have in life. We're looking for smiles and sex and status and friends and avoiding enemies and membership in groups. And this makes it really complicated. Many people have proposed specific functions for depression. Each one of these makes, I think, a useful contribution. Uh, Aubrey Lewis, who founded the Institute of Psychiatry, um, and Gerald Clareman, who is a leader in psychiatry at Stanford, noted, noted that depression can be a plea for help. Uh, John Price, a leading British psychiatrist and one of the founders of evolutionary psychiatry, noted its involuntary yielding. And Paul Gilbert, uh, who is a marvelous psychologist, evolutionary a clinical person in the UK uh, has elaborated this. Sickness behavior, conservation of resources. Some people think that depression manipulates others to get resources or disengages from pursuing goals. All of the, there's truth to all of these, but I think that they're miscast because they all talk about the function and depression has many functions. The key to it is not the, not the functions, but the situations. In what situations do the various symptoms of low mood and depression prove useful? I'm gonna pause there for just a moment. 
Um, you notice that I used low mood instead of depression. Uh, as soon as you say depression, a lot of people think you're talking about clinical abnormal bad stuff. And so I try to be careful and say low mood as a kind of more neutral way of describing periods of low motivation and feeling bad about yourself and the like. Um, it's really mild depression that's not severe enough to be called pathological. Um, and it helps us to distinguish between potentially normal and likely abnormal states. None of this is new. Uh, this is William Blake, uh, who on one of his frontispieces said, if any could desire what he is incapable of possessing, despair must be his eternal lot. And I think this, if there is a single situation uh, that's likely to arouse low mood and possibly depression, it's being trapped pursuing an unreachable goal. Uh, it might be getting into a certain school, it might be getting someone to marry you, it might be just getting a job, it might be trying to get your kids off heroin, it might be trying to find a cure for cancer for yourself. It's when people are pursuing unreachable goals that low mood kicks in and sets in place a whole sequence of feelings and behaviors that reassess whether it's worth pursuing that goal or if you should give up and do something else. My psychiatry residents tell me that the single thing I've taught them that's most useful that of everything is this question. Is there something you're trying to do in life that seems so important you can't give it up even though it seems you'll never succeed? Sometimes after I've talked with a patient for an hour, that question will elicit, oh my God, now that you mentioned it, um, I've spent my whole life trying to keep my daughter from being in a situation with an abusive man and she's in one and she won't even answer the phone now and I don't know what to do and I lie awake at night thinking about it. My life is fine, but yeah, we all are often stuck pursuing unreachable goals. A former graduate student of mine, Matt Killer, I took on a very challenging project of bold project really of asking, um, are there different symptoms for different kinds of situations or is it all one situation? And he concluded in a series of two studies and other people have followed this up that the symptoms of depression or low mood are different depending on whether it's social loss causing crying, emotional pain and the like, or failed effort causing anhedonia and fatigue. This is more like symptoms of a cold. If it's in your nose, you have one set of symptoms. If, you, if it's in your chest, you have another set of symptoms. I think we should not be just talking about depression as one thing, it's not. If you wanna see really wonderful recent work on this, uh, look up uh, Iko Fried at icofried.com or org. And he's done marvelous work really dissecting all of the different symptoms of depression and how they're interacting with each other using network analysis. He points out that these standard forms that we use and scales we use summing up symptoms to see how depression, how severe depression is, are just scientifically invalid. We should look at each symptom individually. So yes, I've been acting as if most low mood is useful, even if it's not useful in the in specific instance. I don't believe that. Um, I think that you know a large proportion of the depression I see in the clinic is due to brain pathology. Many, most of my patients who have bad depression have a family history, um, and you know it, it really seems very likely that they are predisposed uh, to have that uh, severe disease. And after you've really seen a lot of patients with depression and you've seen people lying in bed believing that the entire world is going to end within days or that they're impoverished when that's a delusion, you realize that, you know, yes, some depression might be useful, but a whole lot of it is really pathology. But what's missing here is trying to understand which causes are characteristic of the person and which are characteristic of the situation. It has different causes in different individuals and even different causes in the same individual with two different episodes. Some causes are top down, life experiences change a person's motivational structure that changes the brain. Others are bottom up, changes in the brain cause emotions and behavior. Really, we have three main causes and three main treatments. The situation, people try to use psychotherapy to change the situation or our view of it. The meaning of the situation, is changed by cognitive behavioral therapy. And we change the brain with drugs and electroconvulsive therapy. 
all kinds of debates and conflicts between people who emphasize one or the other, um, all can be useful and we should be using them all, but we need to be decide who's going to get the most benefit from each one. Then there are neglected emotional problems, anxiety and low mood get all the attention. What about loneliness, envy, anger, jealousy, guilt, and grief? Um, there can be too much or too little of any of those. I promised to talk about, can computers have emotions? Well, of course they can't feel anything as far as we know, but they certainly do have special states they go into in certain situations. I've tried using my computer out in the sun in Arizona. Um, it's fine for a little while and then it turns off. It says too hot, can't go on, take me inside. Um, and that's a very useful response that the computer has built in. Next, I wanna talk about how we can study ideographic situations that actually are the cause of most symptoms. And I'm gonna argue that denying their power and complexity hobbles psychiatry. The distinction between nomothetic and ideographic causes was made by Wilhelm Wundelband he, as he took on the rectorship of Strasbourg University um, in 1895. And it's really, a, I'm sorry about the jargon, but it's really useful. Nomothetic explanations are general laws like gravity or laws of learning. Ideographic explanations talk about a specific historical sequence, such as how did the Earth's moon form? or how did this individual learn to fear snakes? When we look at causes of depression, people emphasize genes or brain loci, proteins, neurotransmitters, or cognitive distortions, trauma and early neglect. Notice that all of these are characteristics of the person. What about the situation? Um, Kurt Lewin pointed out that behavior is always a function of the person in the environment or the situation. And the fundamental attribution error is the human tendency to use characteristics of a person to explain behavior instead of situations. If a person dips their hand into the um, jar for coffee money to take out a dollar bill, um, you're liable to say that's a dishonest person to explain it. But it might in fact be that the person put in a $5 bill yesterday is taking out change you don't really know. So there are three papers I want to talk about that appeared within the last two weeks, all of which are very relevant to this. Now, the first is a landmark review in the World Psychiatry Journal. It's edited by Mario Maj, and he and some of my good friends and really the world's best depression researchers have gotten together to write a spectacularly comprehensive, clear and well-organized review of depression symptoms, depression causes, and how we can move towards a more personalized approach. Significantly, these are not folks who are mainly looking at brain mechanisms. They're really trying to take everything into account. This is the outline of their article. Uh, they go into the symptoms of depression in great detail and how they're related to each other. Then they go into person factors, personality, physical comorbidities, family history, um, protective factors. And they have one little section called recent environmental exposures. That's the situation. Stress, a lot of people would call it. This is a big picture. All of these causes going to cause depression. I, I can't say enough how much I admire their ability to read hundreds of papers and synthesize them into a single body of knowledge. But what about the situation? I mean, collapsing all we know about a person's life into stress just ignores all kinds of useful information. It's as if neuroscience was collapsed into saying, yes, more brain activity or less brain activity. Um, how about if we look at the specifics? But it's very hard to describe situations objectively. This is another article that appeared just last week in the history of psychiatry uh, by a group of UK authors. Uh, they took data from clinical records starting from 1845 and going up to the present. And they pointed out that successively in every generation, less and less information showed up in psychiatric records about what was going on in a person's life. Um, they talked about a woman who became distraught and delusional after watching the body of her child dragged up from a well that he had fallen into and drowned in, um, as an exemplar of the, what psychiatric records used to describe. 
And I was horrified actually in my own training to find patients described horrific situations that weren't even described in the clinical record. Remember one woman I was interviewing for a research project and I said, well, I went through her symptoms of depression and all. I said, well, do you have any idea how this started? And she said, well, yeah, it's been ever since I got raped three months ago. I said, oh my gosh, what happened? And she told me a very horrific story. And, and I said something about, but there's nothing like this in the chart. And she said, well, I told them. And I talked to her doctor and her doctor said, well, not everybody who gets raped gets depressed, which is certainly true. But we shouldn't just dismiss things uh, because they don't, you know, they're not causes all by themselves. So this is a wonderful article historically of psychiatry. And there's another one uh, that came out, a 92 page publication by the British Psychological Society, um, a report on understanding depression. And a couple of quotes from this, it argues that depression is best thought of as an experience or a set of experiences rather than a disease unlikely to be a result of an underlying biological disease process or chemical imbalance for most people, they say. So here we are, year 2020, hard research going on by hundreds of good scientists for decades now, and we're still disagreeing profoundly on whether we should attend carefully to what's going on in individual lives or not. And people are making generalizations about it. My stance on this is, hey, everybody, Different patients have different kinds of causes. Let's look at each of them individually. And this guy takes us to the reality of ideographic depression causes. Oh my gosh, I should have given you a trigger warning before this one. This is the reality of the causal pathways that lead to symptoms. Your symptoms are out here. And all kinds of things influence person variables, early environment, abuse, neglect, use of substances, genes, all kinds of things influence a situation, especially these person variables interacting. But different individuals have different pathways to depression. This one, this unfortunate individual had a good early family life and has a decent life situation, but unfortunately has genes that change brain mechanisms that make depression the center and major problem for her life. I've seen way too many patients like this. There's something wrong. This is one where there's no genetic predisposition. Uh, this person was fine until she got breast cancer. And three weeks later, her husband said, you know what, I'm very sorry, but I, I've decided I really, for a long time now, haven't loved you after all, and I need to move on with my life. And he left. Oh, well, that happens. It's so devastating, you hardly want to talk about it. Guess what? She's depressed. Not only is she depressed, but she doesn't have any income anymore and she's losing her medical insurance. Um, that's a pretty straightforward but awful one. This is a person who's always had trouble getting along with people, has been through several marriages. This particular divorce has left the person without an income and alone in her apartment. Has to do with early environment and parents' behavior, shaping her personality and all the rest. But it's multiple things happening. And of course, even these three kind of examples are simplistic compared with a far more common situation, which is, oh, well, here's another fourth one that's fairly straightforward. This person mainly has tendencies to drink too much and those drinking wrecks one's life and that wrecks one's life causes psychological mechanisms and symptoms and brain mechanisms. And finally, we come to what I say is, you see this all too often. Uh, this person had, unfortunately, tendencies uh, to not only depression, but also substance abuse. And the parents, too, um, had tendencies to mental instability and substance use. And therefore, and related, the person was abused in early life, and that led to complications in marriage and complications in work. It's, this is hard. I mean, I, I do feel like trigger warnings are appropriate for researchers seeing this kind of thing because, hey, what are you supposed to do with this? On the other hand, if this is reality, and it is, we shouldn't just avert our eyes and try to look for the cause of depression. We should start digging in and trying to understand this kind of ideographic complexity and taking it seriously. 
So my conclusion about depression causes is they're characteristics of the person, both innate and acquired, that interact with situations that are often idiosyncratic to the individual in top, down, and bottom up causal tangles. What we look for, what we find. So dissatisfying. What should we do? I think we can use an evolutionary explanation of how emotions are aroused by situations to bring ideographic data in to a scientific framework. In medicine, we do a review of systems asking about what's going on in each area. I've suggested we should do a review of social systems for every patient we see. We should review the situation for their social situation, their occupation, their children and family, their income, their abilities, appearance and health, and their love and sex life. This turns out to reveal all kinds of things that you often don't get by asking a person, have you been under stress? Robert Wood Johnson has a report in September a few years ago, um, looking at what contributes to stress, asking people what causes it. And I'm pleased to say that these categories, these six categories I've proposed fit very nicely, S-O-C-I-A-L, with what people report. We could do much more with this if we went into the details of how each of these things interacts with each other. It takes a while, it takes too long for efficient clinical care, but for research, we should be doing it. In every area, we should be trying to figure out what the person has, what they want, what they're planning to do, what they expect, what they are repressing, you can't just ask them that, what their current concerns are and how they're feeling about how things are going. Um, this takes quite a while, but this actually tells us what's going on in a person's life. I have a computer program that takes estimates of all these kinds of things and graphs them in terms of what a person has and what they expect and predicted intensity of negative emotions on the right hand side. Moving to a whole different topic. Why can't we control our eating and drinking and everything else? This is behavior out of control. These are positive feedback cycles that are products of interaction with modern environmental situations. Uh, there was never enough alcohol and cocaine around reliably uh, to cause chronic alcoholism uh, a thousand years ago, a um, hundred years ago, maybe. The other thing that's going on here is that we humans have quite a lot of confidence that our willpower can control our behavior. So we tell ourselves, well, I can take cocaine and enjoy it. I'll just quit. It's only those weak people who ha have trouble quitting. And that might be the end of that person's life. For addiction, marvelous, useful research going on about the mechanisms, which I hope will find medications that disrupt the cycles that maintain the cycle of addiction. But Kent Berridge and I worked hard to try to figure out why we're all vulnerable. And the simple explanation is that motivation mechanisms are mediated by chemicals. And once modern situations allow ready access to those chemicals and modern ways of administering them, some people are going to have their motivation system taken over. And even their best willpower is not enough to stop. A question remains about why some people are especially prone to addiction. It's profoundly genetic how risky it is for you. But I think we should be asking, not assuming that those people have bad genes, I think we should be asking, how would those people behave differently from other people in a natural environment? In particular, would they forge differently? Uh, several people have told me that they've heard this talk years ago when I gave it to addiction conferences and they pursued this work, but I haven't found the, the results of their work. It'd be lovely to look at children and turn and loose foraging uh, for apples or strawberries and look at how they forage differently and if that predicts any risk or if it intersects with uh, gene vulnerability to addiction. Eating disorders, it's not just a modern problem. Anytime people have dieted intensely, restrictive dieting, eating disorders have become a problem, but it's become worse in recent decades, probably because of media exposure. How can we understand the cycles that trap people? Well, it's a real positive feedback cycle where attempts at control cause loss of control because you set off a famine protection system that makes you go get whatever food you possibly can find and eat it very quickly. That causes fear that you're going to gain weight and actual increased weight, which is part of the famine control mechanism. If food supplies are erratic, higher body weight is in fact useful. 
that leads to stricter and more intense attempts at control, which sets off this very vicious cycle and delusions. Um, there's all kinds of richness here. Um, and one of the evolutionary psychiatrists, uh, central to the evolutionary psychiatry special interest group, Agnes Anton, is working on this. Um, many factors influence the motivation to diet and the tendency to get trapped in this cycle. But I think the fundamental issue is that there's a famine of protection mechanism that's set off by intense dieting. We really need a cybernetic analysis of these kinds of things in terms of feedback control and how normal homeostatic mechanisms get disrupted. So why is sex so often unsatisfying? Uh, I could give a whole lecture, and sometimes I do, about sexual disorders and evolutionary frameworks, but we're going to do just one simple quick one today. Um, every sex disorders book has one chapter about slow or absent female orgasm and another chapter about fast or premature male orgasm. Not a one has a chapter about why one problem is characteristic of women and the other is characteristic of men. Think about it with me for just a minute. Um, why do men routinely climax before women? And why is it that after climax, men stop, they get very sensitive, and some women can go on. A lot of women can go on. Uh, Princess Bonaparte uh, thought that it was the position of the clitoris um, and its proximity to the vagina. And she was so frustrated herself by lack of orgasms from intercourse that she arranged to have surgery herself to rearrange things. It didn't work. Uh, she continued a very active sex life with the premier of France, I think, for some time. She also was the person who rescued Freud. Um, she was the one who raised the funds to buy his way out of Nazi Germany and set him up in London. Um, marvelous story there if you'd like to read about it. But the research is still needed. Um, how often is it that women stop intercourse before a man's orgasm, either because of sensitivity or just lack of interest? Um, it certainly is not that often, but if it happens very often at all, that would be a strong selection force for ensuring that on the average, men have their orgasms well before women, because that is what's needed to ensure reproduction. Then there are all the other sexual problems. We're not going to go into those today. So our final big topic is why genes for dire disorders persist. These are things like schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, many highly heritable diseases, they devastate fitness. Um, why do these genes stick around if the people who have them have fewer children than other people do? For schizophrenia, which is quite characteristic, most of these are similar, 1% prevalence worldwide. There's some difference, but not dramatically. It's highly heritable. Most of whether you get schizophrenia or not depends on your genes, not on your rearing. Drastic reproduced reproduction. And there are no, now that we've done the work, we know there are no common genetic variations that have large effects. Here's a study, and I have colleagues who spent their entire lives looking for candidate genes for schizophrenia. 25 of them were identified. And then people went back and looked with larger database. There's no evidence that any of them are more associated with schizophrenia than non-candidate genes. It was a good idea, but looking for candidate genes for schizophrenia just hasn't worked. I wish it would work. I wish we could find brain loci. It hasn't worked. A common view here, going back to my revised version of causes of disorders, is that natural selection just can't do better. Is it mutations and genetic drift, developmental stochasticity? But why these disorders, not others? And why are they at 1% prevalence? Um, other work by Matt Keller and his group looked at all the schizophrenia associated alleles that have been identified. Turns out they're all the same in one respect. They all explain the same proportion of variation. And that proportion is 0.04%, tiny. There are no alleles out here. These are common ones. These are um, the ones that have worse effects, but they're all kind of on the same line here. There aren't any out here. Why not? Very likely because they've been selected out. 
Intrinsically vulnerable systems is the thing that I'm trying to think deeply about now. I'm arguing that some systems are pushed to a performance peak despite causing risks. At first, I started thinking about the cannon bone of a horse. Uh, and in an article in 1990, I argued that cliff edge effects might help explain vulnerability to something like schizophrenia. Horses are bred for speed. And what you get is that cannon bone getting longer, thinner, lighter, and more likely to break. The right push from a, long, a sturdy, fat, thick cannon bone to a long, thin one that makes them run faster, but one step too far and they go over the cliff edge. This means that all horses are vulnerable to this, just like we all are vulnerable to schizophrenia, but only a few fall off the cliff edge. Natural selection does not, in fact, shape traits to the peak, because at that peak, some of the offspring are going to not be there. So this is a diagram of overclocking computers. Can computers have mental disorders? Well, of course, they too can't think. But it's perfectly possible to take your computer and make it run faster than it's designed to run, if you dare. Because the people who design those chips build in a margin of error to make them robust and not fail, um, it turns out that if you overclock your computer, you probably can get extra performance out of it, except that it might melt, not exactly melt, but fail uh, from high temperatures, or otherwise just stop working properly because the signals can't get back and forth to each other in a timely way. Uh, best book I've read recently is by John von Neumann, The Computer and the Brain, 1955. Um, but he outlined beautifully how the brain is and is not like a computer. And the fact that it's enormously compact, takes about 10 watts to run it, which is a lot of energy. Um, and neurons conduct relatively slowly. So the brain has to be massively parallel computing in its design instead of sequential. And his, he also he makes the point that it's kind of like a computer, but it's fundamentally completely different um, in its organizational structure. This is a normal fitness function we use for all kinds of traits. We assume that fitness is distributed and its peak is at the peak there. And the trait distribution is more narrow. Most individuals will be someplace here towards the middle. Selection squashes it in, mutation pushes it out. And if you get pushed too far out, you get disease. This is the Cliff Edge and Schizophrenia article I mentioned. If the fitness function increases rapidly near a cliff edge, selection will shape the average phenotype to a value that leaves some individuals over the edge and vulnerable to disease. So again, individual fitness, number of offspring is peaking there. But the number of but the offspring themselves have a distribution like that, and some of them are going to be off the edge of the cliff. Quite a few of them will be off the edge of the cliff from that individual. An individual there will have offspring like that. Not very many will be off the cliff, but some will. Maybe 1% in the mathematical model that I've developed, which seems awfully like what we've been seeing with schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disease, obsessive compulsive disorder, epilepsy, and a bunch of other diseases. Essentially, I'm arguing that we shouldn't just be looking for mutations. We should be looking at the fitness function shape and whether that results inevitably in natural selection, optimizing where it sets that trait for maximizing gene transmission, despite the fact that some individuals pay a price. This is recent data, this is all coming along so fast. Um, the number of loci on each chromosome relevant to schizophrenia is proportional to the size of the chromosome. You know, we keep looking for the specific bad guys, they're everywhere across the genome and proportional to chromosome size. There's background selection, but no positive selection on schizophrenia alleles. Not more about that now. We can know that mutations and loss of function intolerant genes cause schizophrenia. But when we look at the variant locations, how many of them are on exons where they actually turn into proteins? Not so many. Um, lots of them are intronic, intergenic. 
um, we're just gradually coming to recognize that our simplistic notions of bad genes um, are just so primitive. It's the things that influence disease are all over the genome and they're regulators uh, of all kinds. And finally, there, this is devastating for our ideas that there are separate disorders with separate genetic causes. We find very high genetic correlations across different disorders. That is, the same genes that make you vulnerable to autism also can make you vulnerable to uh, schizophrenia. The same vulnerable uh, genes that make you vulnerable to anxiety also make you vulnerable to depression. So this is what I'm thinking about now. I'd be glad to be in touch with any of you who are working along similar lines. It's really trying to understand why natural selection shapes certain traits to, to levels that leave some individuals vulnerable. And in particular, I'm wondering if this could perhaps explain the finding for so many diseases, not just psychiatric, where they're highly heritable, but caused by thousands of genes with tiny effects. Maybe we should not be thinking about those as all deleterious mutations or genes that are there because of genetic drift. Maybe we should be thinking about the fitness functions that are responsible. So conclusions of the main points that I've tried to make, bad feelings are adaptations, but they're usually useless. They're aroused by ideographic situations, and we really must start trying to understand individuals as individuals. Behaviors go out of control in positive feedback loops, especially in modern environments. Sex optimizes reproduction at the cost of satisfaction. And finally, some genetic variations that cause disease are mutations, but others may influence traits that are intrinsically vulnerable because they've been pushed to a performance peak. And I'll leave us again with our wish. We wish everything could be like an Italian garden planned by a designer and laid out with nice comprehensible lines. But what we find, not just in mental disorders, not just in medicine, but in all of biology is a tangled bank. And to explain it, we need evolutionary biology. Thank you very much. I hope there are lots of questions. If you haven't posted a question yet, please post one now. I look forward to that uh, very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And indeed, there are many questions coming through. Um, I will start with a comment and a question from Adam Hunt. This was on the YouTube channel. It is astounding that medicine and evolutionary biology stayed apart for so long. A little slower here for I'm having trouble hearing you. Hearing me, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. Says, <laughs> Adam Hunt, I got it, Adam, Adam Hunt. He's a, he says, it's astounding that medicine and evolutionary biology have stayed apart for so long. But he asked on the important question of scaling up mental health treatment, we hope evolutionary psychiatry could be preventative, but I'd be interested to hear about cost-effective widespread solutions. Yes, I mean, I, historians will eventually try to figure out why evolutionary biology has not always been a foundation for medicine. And I think it's because if you want to fix things and find out specific causes, you're, you're working on why individuals get sick and, and mechanisms. Uh, I don't think evolutionary approaches are as useful in the short term. But I do think if you're looking for trying to understand causes of things and trying to understand diseases more deeply, you absolutely must take the second question about why we're all, all vulnerable. And this will lead us to find new solutions. It sounded like Adam was asking about how we could convince everybody in psychiatry that this is useful. Is that right? Or Yeah, I think so. He gives an example. Would encouraging better social connections and public support groups, somewhat reminiscent of an ancestral life, help treat mismatch cause oh. disorders and some forms of depression? Yes, yes. You know, I have often thought, you know, I, I, here's a diagnosis that's missing from the DSM. It's called mother with two young children and a man who abuses her and doesn't come around very much and doesn't give her much money. I mean, that, that's just a classic situation that causes terrible depression and suicidality. Um, and you can call it depression, the disease, but no, no, this is, this is a diagnosis 610.6. It should be. Um, and what I thought those women needed was ways of getting together with other women who were in the same boat. And that turned out to be much more helpful when I could arrange it. 
But of course, that's not the way our system is organized. In the UK, I think you are better organized uh, to do such social interventions, although perhaps not all that advanced. And I think for all of us in modern life, we used to be very close with you know dozens of family members within walking distance. Um, now, uh, we fly all about the globe and we're isolated by ourselves without family in different distant cities. Um, and we're, we, 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 we adapt remarkably well and we use things like Zoom and telephones to try to connect each other. Um, but I think the sense of security and, and love that you get from being with family members and the conflict you get from being with family members um, is not, not in the lives of many people these days. So I, th I think that's a profound suggestion, but how the heck do we do it? I don't know. Thank you. Um, Ramsey on YouTube asks, Randy, should we look forward to developing an evolutionary psychiatry-based diagnostic criteria instead of the arbitrary ones we're dealing with nowadays? So Dan Stein and I spent the better part of a year uh, convinced that we could, by using evolutionary principles, improve upon the DSM. And it was such fun working with Dan because he knows so much about psychiatry and philosophy and diagnosis. You know, he, he, he's just wonderful. Um, and at the end of that work, we concluded, you know what? DSM does a pretty good job of describing uh, the conditions that you see in the clinic. It's just unfortunate that it doesn't lead you to specific causes, and that's because those specific causes probably don't exist uh, for most disorders in the way that we would like them to. I'm gonna pause there for a moment and saying, we will find specific causes for some of these disorders, yet I hope. I mean, it might well be future that we find some particular anomaly uh, in brain development that leads to vulnerability to schizophrenia something about pruning or something like that. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do that research. It should go on full speed ahead, but we should not expect that it's going to lead to causes and solutions for all these disorders. So I think we should be trying to um, expand our diagnostic system to not just paste a diagnosis on people, but we should be trying to understand each person in terms of the many causal factors that can come. The fundamental thing that Dan and I suggested changing is separating out emotions and their disorders from other things, because emotions are symptoms, except when they're not. You know, just, just like pain is a symptom uh, of disorders, not a disease itself, until it becomes a disease itself. Chronic pain is a terrible, terrible problem. Chronic pain is explained, I think, by the same kind of sensitization. Um, that we find with anxiety and mood. Repeated episodes make these systems more sensitive. And I think this could lead us to thinking differently and finding different kinds of inter interventions to block those self-sensitizing mechanisms. Great, thank you. The same person um, asked if you could also please give some more details on the psychopharmacology as related to, to EPSYC. So Dan, Dan and I also wrote a recent article uh, for a psychopharmacology journal, uh, suggesting that if we did take a more explicitly evolutionary view, that should lead us to finding new drugs more quickly. In particular for depression, I mean, if you know what mood is for and how it's regulated by different situations, you should be able to use those situations to set up situations for rats that are far more sophisticated evolutionarily than the ones we use now. An anecdote here is that um, every single day a new article is published using what's called the pore salt test to test for new antidepressant drugs. That test consists of taking a rat and dropping it in a beaker of water and seeing how long it swims. You take some rats on a drug and others who are not on a drug and you see if the drug makes them swim longer. Uh, drugs that make rats swim longer are likely to be better antidepressants. So this is something that works. Um, what nobody really mentions is the fact that the rats that swim less long, they don't give up and drown. They just stop paddling and keep their noses just barely above water, resting. The ones that keep paddling because they're on drugs, those are the ones that are actually more likely to drown because they're exhausting themselves. It's just a profound insight to what we're really doing with our psychopharmacological tests. I think we could find better tests if we looked um, on the other hand, Dan, Dan and I hoped that we would get pharmaceutical firms wanting our consultation uh, to find new ways of looking for new drugs. Hasn't happened yet. Maybe some of, someone will be listening in for this talk. 
Thank you. Um, this is a comment from Mark Friedman. I think that so many of the psychoses are caused by the pressures of living under capitalism. The lack of human solidarity, financial and lack of healthcare pressures. Racism and sexism are so deeply rooted in society's profits over human needs. Capitalism equals individualism versus collective, solidar collective solidarity. Society must change to rectify individual psychological issues. So it clearly is the case that social structures influence the rate of mental disorders, um, but I don't think there's that much evidence that capitalism is the main problem. Uh, if you look at the US compared to other countries, it has the highest rates of depression in the entire world. We're the, we're the world leader in so many things, COVID, depression. Um, on the other hand, if you look at Japan and Taiwan, their rates of depression are more like 10 to 20% of ours and those are capitalist countries. Um, do we have lower rates of depression in, in communist countries? Well, it depends. Uh, when I lived in Berlin for a year, people told me about living in East Berlin and how they missed it uh, because it did offer you know, security of a certain sort, uh, but they also missed opportunities. So they were very ambivalent about things. Of course, none of these are these situations are relevant to the situations in which we evolved, which is in small hunter gatherer groups. And I'm counting on you and other anthropologists uh, to do the work that's never been done, to look at rates of these kinds of problems in populations that are living a hunter and gathering lifestyle. Kim Hill, I talk with quite a lot about this. And for years, he told me he didn't see any mental health problems to speak of until he opened a clinic. And as soon as he opened the clinic, it was very clear that all kinds of people had problems with depression and anxiety and other problems. Fascinating. Yeah, I think that is work that needs to be done. Um, another question, um, if male ejaculation is so essential for continuation of the species, which may explain why many men have premature ejaculation, why would women orgasm at all? Why would it be delayed? Why do women what? I didn't hear that. Why, why do women? women orgasm at all? Why would it not be just, why would it be delayed instead of not just existing? Yeah. So this, this all gets very complicated very fast, doesn't it? Um, oh, actually, I can see, if, am I starting to see something in this so I can read these things myself? Yeah, I put this in the chat box. I'm sorry that the, our connection is bad. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of books and bitter arguments about um, why women have orgasms and, the, 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 and is this just an epiphenomenon or, or, or is it functional? And I don't want to even go there to, to rile people up about, uh, I don't know how we, how we answer that. Um, but it is interesting that so many men um, have an intense urge to stop immediately and that women's sexual response is different in that many, most women can continue um, even after having an orgasm, uh, that's exactly as it should be uh, to maximize reproduction. And as I mentioned in my talk, it's just astounding that, I mean, I, I've talked with leading sex researchers to say, what's the data on this? And it hasn't been gathered. Uh, any graduate student could make that a good project to do in a few months. Okay. Um, it's probably better for me to put the questions in the chat box, but will you read out the question before answering it? That would be good. Yes, thanks. So Dr. Denise Salale from UCL says, hi, great talk as always. My question, do you think the cliff edge hypothesis applies to antisocial personality disorder like sociopathy? So the leader in thinking about sociopathy years past was Linda Mealy, who tragically died young from cancer. And she argued that it was a frequency dependent strategy that got you great gains when most people in the social group were altruists and only a few existed who could take advantage of the rubes. Um, and that might well be the case. Uh, I've never been quite convinced that it's an adaptation per se, because my understanding, the few I've seen and what I've read, a lot of people who have sociopathy also have minor neurological signs. Um, it's clearly highly heritable, uh, but I've always viewed it as something of a disadvantage that, on the other hand, some sociopaths sure have a lot of kids by tricking people into having sex with them. Um, Cliff edge effect, are we all pushed towards some edge of sociopathy um, to the point where um, we're risking things? I'm not sure that applies here. I would point out more the, the mystery and the marvel that so many people are good 
And so many people can have stable long-term relationships, even sexual relationships, for goodness sakes, foregoing other sexual opportunities. That is such a mystery and, and marvelous thing for stability of, of human life and, and stability of fortunate people who have long-term relationships. Their dissatisfactions as well as satisfactions, of course. But I have a whole separate lecture I give about social selection and the origins of morality and stable social relationships in a sentence. Um, People who please other people and who are good potential partners get big advantages, even aside from sex or sexual partners. And that means we all are so extraordinarily sensitive to what other people think about us, which is wonderful. And you, each of you can think of people you know who are not very sensitive to what other people think, <laughs> and they're really a pain. Um, on the other hand, most of us lie awake wondering if we said the wrong thing. Um, and when I talk with people who have social anxiety, it helps them a lot to realize that there is a worse condition that is not enough social anxiety to make them help realize that you know, it, it's a useful thing to be socially sensitive. And here's one from Gabriella. Um, she says, thank you for passing your talk. You mentioned a lot about mental disorders such as depression. Could you speak a little about things like ADHD and autism? Um, there are a number of good articles about ADHD in the child psychiatry literature. Uh, some of them arguing that actually it's not much of a disorder, that if you don't have to sit in the chair and learn to read, and if you can be out running around in the bush, it might in fact be advantageous. Um, I've never seen, you know, one thing that I haven't seen enough kids with ADHD to feel like I'm qualified to speak about it. And I think so many people in evolution and psychiatry um, haven't really seen many cases. Um, and it makes it very hard to say something sensible about things that, that you're unfamiliar with. So I haven't gotten into the ADHD story. I've also been impressed that kids who live on the shores of Lake Michigan and eat more than three meals of fish each week are way more likely to have ADHD. Maybe it really is a product of toxins or, or something. So I'm, I'm just not knowledgeable about ADHD. Autism I've been very interested in, and in particular the possibility that it has something to do with lack of silencing of or, or, or failure to silence the X chromosome in males um, because you know you got to do it just right. You've got to turn off an X chromosome um, in females so that you get balanced um, genetic expression. And for males, the X chromosome is is what if these what if it doesn't work right? Um, what if you get things expressed or not expressed that that shouldn't be? Um, that's a possibility and a, and, a, and a factor that that might might be relevant. If you, if you get imprinting that silences things that should not be silenced. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of people talk about autism as just uh, you know, not neurotypical and, and the like. Um, the fact is that kids with autism, 15% of them have epilepsy. Um, and there's new data showing that brain growth, that, that their brains are, are smaller than average at birth and they peak at 20% above average at age one year, and then they gradually settle down to an average size by age four or five years. And there's something fundamentally interesting and profound going on in autistic brain development. And I, I remain having high hopes that we can figure out what to do about that. I've been long skeptical that the supposed increase in risk of autism is real. I thought it was just because of different case finding and offering special kinds of schooling for people with the diagnosis. But now I'm becoming convinced it might actually be becoming more common. One possible explanation for that is the peculiar mating system we have now. The mating system essentially stratifies everybody by their academic ability and throws them together into uh, lower, middle, high, and highest areas. And the kids who end up at Caltech or Oxford are very peculiar. Um, they have peculiar genes and that selective association of those genes, especially over a couple of generations, could well lead to um, anomalies that would make certain disorders more common as a result of the sort of mating. So there, there are all kinds of interesting possibilities here. 
Let's see, Paul, Peter Gray asks, for many people experiencing depression, especially students closely tied to the pandemic, how would you frame depression and responses to it in an evolutionary frame? I think a lot of what people are experiencing is sadness. You can't do what you wanna do. And you're anxious about, you know, giving the disease to a relative or catching the disease from a relative. But mostly I think the pandemic means we can't pursue our life goals. We're trying to do things, but you can't go out dating. You can't have sex. You can't have go out to dinner. You can't do all, you can't, you know, do your performances. You can't open your new restaurant. You have all these goals in life that you can't pursue. And so most of us are stuck um, with goals that we can't really pursue. And, and a normal system kicks in saying, should you really be trying to do this thing that you can't do? Uh, so I think understanding that low mood is, is normal in that circumstance might be useful. I don't think it solves the situation, unfortunately. What we need is um, masks and vaccines. And Anonymous says, thanks so much. Uh, why do you think women are more at risk of depression in the 21st century? Is it because the environment does not buffer as much about traits such as neurological ones? Are women more likely to work zero or other contracts, households led by women? So sex differences in depression and anxiety have fascinated me. And Brent Winograd, one of the first architects of evolution and psychiatry, wrote quite a good book about different women's roles as a result of evolutionary circumstances and the fact that they had fewer resources and fewer options and therefore more often were trapped in bad situations, um, causing increased rates of anxiety and depression. Um, it turns out, however, that um, the twofold increase of anxiety and depression for women is in most cultures. And in cultures where women have more social power and more freedom and, and flexibility, um, it's not as if that distortion goes away. Women do seem to be fundamentally more vulnerable to anxiety and depression. I don't, my guess is it's probably not going to turn out to be do mostly to social circumstances, although certainly those are very relevant. There are even brain differences in serotonin, serotonin transmitter binding uh, between males and females, even in rats. On the other hand, this does not mean that, you know, the social circumstances such as the diagnosis I proposed for young women with two kids and an abusive husband, um, that's also very relevant. I think this is a classic example of how we need to try to understand things one by one. And Sarah Spellman says, um, any thoughts on whether the Rat Pack experiments still have anything useful to say with regards to the individual as situated in the environment? What? So when I think Rat Pack, I think of, you know, singers in Las Vegas. And I'm not sure the Rat Pack ex experiments, do, do you mean the Rat Pack as in dipping the rats into beakers of water? Is that what you're speaking of? Let me see if she follows up. Um, I think she says Rat Park. Rat, rat Park. Mm -hmm. so, so there are wonderful experiments done by a fellow in Utah uh, using a rat barn or a, a mouse barn where mice are able to interact um, in a fairly natural setting and they compete pretty meanly with each other. And when some of them dominate others, the ones that lose the fights tend to go off by themselves in a corner and huddle and not do too much. And this comes back to, I think, one of the most profound and useful sub explanations for low mood and depression. And that's this involuntary yielding that John Price talked about. And when in fact you've lost a status battle and the person who beat you is still there ready to beat you on the head again. Um, if you keep fighting and keep challenging that person, uh, you're likely to get beat up again, either physically or emotionally or socially. And as a result, one good strategy is to quit fighting. And not only that, view yourself as incapable of competing. So I think this idea, if this person is, that, that's what they're talking about, uh, that, that's a very profound idea. And I think it's led to good clinical interventions. Paul Gilbert is one of the experts in this and uh, several other people in the UK have advanced these ideas. Henry O'Connell, is creationism, tacit or otherwise, a barrier to evolutionary psychiatry, professional development in the US? I'm sorry, but it sure is. Um, a remarkable number of doctors are creationists. 
There was at one time I was trying to find the director of medical education for the American Medical Association to see if I could convince him that we should be adding in uh, evolution to the basic medical curriculum. Then I looked him up and it turns out that he spent his spare time um, teaching creationism to Sunday schools and going around his state. Uh, and, and the like. Now, it's not that common. The doctors are generally educated people, um, but they have very little idea about how natural selection actually works. Some idea of it being selection survival of the fittest, um, some kind of brutal kind of thing. The idea, yes, they know that natural selection has shaped organs, but the idea that natural selection shapes things to maximize reproduction and not health is a new idea for most of them fundamental thing, the very idea that we need evolutionary explanations in addition to explanations of mechanisms um, is a new idea. So we really need to start back at undergraduate days and thank you, people are doing it. Paula, for instance, is teaching a course on evolution and medicine to students at Oxford, and some of them will go on, uh, and no matter what field they enter, they're going to have a background um, knowing these fundamentals, and some of them will choose to advance this whole area of knowledge by taking it much further than we have been able to so far. I think we're beyond our original time by quite a bit, so maybe we should just take one or two more and wrap up. Yeah, we have exactly that. I've just put one um, question here from uh, an anonymous person in the box, and then that's it. And Paula is, is agreeing with Mark Friedman about the mismatch between uh, evolutionary history and capitalist societies, erosion of welfare, precarious and lack of dignity. What about the possibility that some are diagnosed and people who don't fit the capitalist norm, school refusal syndrome? Yeah, Takasubo. Uh, no, Takasubo is a cardiac thing. Um, hikikomori is a disease that I've been very fascinated by. Hikikomori is a, a Japanese name for a young person who, instead of going out into a career, retreats to a parent's basement, if they have a basement, otherwise a small room in a Japanese house, and doesn't do much of anything except play video games. It's much more common in boys than girls, um, and it can be terrible with these kids just sitting there for extended periods of time. There even, there's even a profession of young women whose job it is to visit with and get out of the house these young boys who have hikikomori. And of course, this is not just a Japanese syndrome. I've seen so many young Americans who you know, don't see any way of really making progress, either in making status or friends or jobs. I saw one particular man who's he's seared on my memory. He came in and he said, I, you, you gotta do something doctor. I've been in treatment for three years now. I'm living in my parents' basement. I don't wanna do anything. I'm terribly depressed. I'm thinking about suicide. And I said, so what do you do exactly? He says, well, I just play video games. I said, well, do you go out? No, not at all. I can't go out, there's no point because I'm just depressed. And I said, well, what about your depression? He says, well, I've seen several different doctors and they've tried me on seven different drugs. None of them will work. I just have to wait until a new drug is found that's gonna get me better. And this is, I mean, this, is, this is the worst kind of, you know, a person frames their own disorder as passively waiting for their brain to get fixed. There are people for whom the brain does need to get fixed. You know, I've seen people who have waited and not wanted to take drugs and they take drugs and finally they get better. So going back to treating individuals as individuals, but I do think, you know, the social competition, especially these days, especially for young people, and they have to demonstrate not, I mean, we give all these privileges to smart kids. It's so unfair. Um, most kids immediately are meant to feel like they're not especially valuable in society uh, because they don't get into a fancy college or go to college. Only half the kids go to college in the United States. And so we wonder about people's political uprisings um, and, and resentment against the privileged group who happen to be those who happen to be, you know, have more academic ability. Um, but, but just calling it capitalism, I think, doesn't do justice to the whole system. I mean, I think that, you know, there's social competition that always goes on everywhere. Um, and finding ways, finding what, what I call refuges from the competition. I think churches can provide that, social groups can provide that, families can provide that. And I think there are fewer refuges from the bitter social competition uh, than there used to be for, for many people. 
um, and that we need to create more of them if we can. That would be really, really helpful. In the UK, a great push has been made to expand cognitive behavioral therapy. I think that's very useful. I think a lot of people do have distorted thinking that makes them feel worthless for no particular purpose. Um, but it's also the case that, as you suggest, social circumstances um, need to be investigated. There used to be a thing called social psychiatry that was investigating these kinds of things. Um, but at least in this country, you know, all the funding goes for looking for the brain abnormalities, um, none for trying to investigate the social circumstances, in part because it's so hard to quantify and get reliable results that are statistically significant. But I think we should be trying in any case. Thank you so much. This has been brilliant and fascinating. And I'm really sorry if uh, we couldn't get to all the questions available. Um, but yes, we are considerably over time. Um, Next week, uh, on the 18th of November, Professor Tessa Pollard will give a talk um, on group walking, a shared pathway to health. So I hope you can all join us for that. Um, and we will say 